In January 1982 in Tehran, a 16-year-old girl was arrested and sentenced to death for political crimes. Marina Nermat was rounded up with hundreds of others and sent to Avin, Iran's most notorious jail. There, two men interrogated her. One tortured her. The other, Ali, fell in love with her. Moments before her execution, Ali had her sentence changed to life in prison. But in return, he exacted a heavy price. Marina Nermat has since fled to Canada, where she currently lives with her husband and children. Her memoir is called Prisoner of Tehran, and she joins me in the studio. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you for having me. Marina, tell us why you were arrested in the first place. Well, it was really very simple. You know, before the revolution, we had a normal life. You know, I had a normal life compared to the North American standard uh, standards. I, I listened to music. I loved Donnie and Marie Osmond and the Bee Gees. I had this huge poster, you know, over my bed. And, I, you know, I loved partying, playing basketball, going out. We uh, owned a cottage by the Caspian Sea. Uh, you know, I went partying with friends and, you know, riding my bike and wearing bikinis. And, you know, it was all about boys and about social activities and, you know, just things that normal teenagers do. But then things changed. The revolution happened. It changed everything. It turned the world upside down. And I was a very good student. I wanted to become a medical doctor. But um, it didn't, you really, after the revolution, they replaced all of our teachers with uh, 18, 19-year-old revolutionary guards who were not qualified to teach at all. So we lost all of our wonderful teachers who were great. And then suddenly we, we, were, we faced a situation where we would sit in the classroom and listen to government pro- propaganda and uh, Quran studies. So that was it. And it was very upsetting after a while. So I raised my hand during calculus one day, and I said to the teacher, Miss, can you please teach her some calculus? I wasn't good in math. You know, I couldn't just go home and open the book and learn things. So I needed help. And she said, well, if you don't like what I teach, leave. And I was 14 years old at the time. And the class was staring at me. So I thought, okay, I started something. I better finish it. So I collected my books and I walked out. And that was when I realized most of my classmates had followed me out. We were all standing in the hall- hallway thinking, okay, what do we do now? So I thought we'll go in the yard, have a snack, you know, have a laugh, that kind of thing. Nobody took it seriously. And then by noon, everybody, this was a huge school, I think with 1,200 students at the time. Everybody was outside in the yard. Nobody wanted to go back to class because everybody said, oh, we feel the same. And I was known, I suddenly became known as the leader of the strike and as a representative of the students. So, you know, this was just, just something, you know, just one of those teenage things that you do and it kind of gets out of hand and then you're stuck with it. And so you had somehow gotten yourself on a list. Yes, because the principal was a revolutionary guard. You know, it was a woman who was a revolutionary guard. So this was actually this period of time. Now that I look back, I realized that they were really, they were really cracking down on everybody who was against the government. They were really trying to figure out who their friends and who their enemies were. And you were, this 14-year-old girl, considered an enemy of the state. Absolutely, because I started, after this strike, I suddenly, you know, felt like, you know, I had a mission here. So I started the school newspaper. I started writing about, um, you know, all the things that was going on in the country. For example, the hijab had become mandatory, women's rights, you know, all these things. And, of course, you know, I ended up on the list because I was speaking against the government. Now, eventually, kids on this list started getting arrested, and people that you knew were getting arrested, and you knew that they were not coming back. That's correct. So you knew it was a matter of time, and you were going to be arrested. Absolutely. But you know what? When you're, again, you're, when you're 14, 15, 16 years old, bad things only happen to other people. So you, you thought you have, were invincible. Absolutely, I was invincible. Every teenager is invincible. You know, one of my, the first girl from my class to be arrested was arrested in the spring of 1981. And she was a good friend of mine. She couldn't hurt a fly. She was executed within two or three months. And we, I knew that. I knew that one of my good friends, we had been together since elementary school, had been killed in prison. And I knew that they would come for me, but there was nowhere to go. Where would I go? But, I mean, you could have gone somewhere, no. go into hiding, no, leave no, the no. country. No, not at all. No, I couldn't leave the country because at the time they wouldn't give me a passport. Once your name was on the list, you could not get a passport. And then the other thing was that if the guards came to your house to arrest you, if you were not home, they would take your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, whoever was home. 
this has had happened to other people. And then you had to go to the prison and give yourself up and they would let your family go. Tell us about the night you were arrested. Well, I remember it really clearly. I can still hear the doorbell. Um, I was in the bathroom. I was getting ready to take a bath. And I, it was nine, nine something at night. And I heard the doorbell. Nobody rang the doorbell at that time. So I knew immediately that this is the guards. You know, they, they, are, they are here to arrest me. Did your parents know that you were going to be arrested? I mean, what I, did they know about all this? You know what? They knew I had done things, but... My parents were never really political. You know, my mom was always saying that, oh, these mullahs, you know, they are not going to last and they are going to go. This was the belief of, of so many people who actually disagreed with the government. Oh, they are not going to last. So they didn't really take them seriously. And these arrests, they, they happened so fast and so quickly. And thousands of people were arrested that nobody had time to react. By the time people realized it was serious, it was already too late. So, you know, I, I, that night, I, when my mother called my name, I opened the door and I went into the hallway and I saw two armed guards pointing their guns at me. And I felt absolutely numb. I felt nothing. Zero. Now I look back, I think I was in shock. That's probably what it means to be in shock. I didn't know at the time, but I was, I, I, it was really like I was watching a movie, like, this is not me, somebody else, who cares, you know, no big deal. And then they put me in the car, they drove toward the prison, and I could see the prison in the distance, the walls, now, and Marina, the barbed wire. Were you able to take anything with you from your home? Um, no, they just said, you have to come with us. And then they told me I have to wear the hijab because I was not wearing the hijab, you know, I was in my house. And um, I am from a Christian family. And they told me to put on the chador, which is the black big piece of cloth that, you know, women put over them. Uh, well, I didn't have that. And I said, well, you know, I can put on a scarf, headscarf. And they said, okay. And I grabbed this big shawl I had uh, because it was winter and I knew it would be cold. So I put that on and then I picked my rosary and I put that in my pocket because I was really religious. I was the kind who was at mass every single day. So I took that with me, and that was it. You know, my clothes that I had on me, and that was it. That's Marina Namet, spelled N-E-M-A-T. She spent over two years in Avin as a political prisoner of the Islamic regime in Iran. She's currently living in Canada. Her memoir is called Prisoner of Tehran. What happened when you got to the prison that night? Well, we got to the gates, and Evin is in north of Tehran at the foothills of the Alborz Mountains, these really tall mountains that look kind of like the Rockies in north of Tehran. Evin is a compound. It's not only one building, so from the outside, you can't really see anything. They blindfolded me when we got to the gates, and then the, the car got in the prison, into the prison area. I couldn't see anything. Uh, they took me into a building. And they told me to sit down in the hallway. And there I, I could hear people being interrogated. And I listened. And then somebody came for me and took me to the interrogation room. When you say you could hear people being interrogated, that means you heard them being tortured? Not at this, at, at this time. It was only like really a kind of people yelling. You know, it wasn't really anybody screaming in pain or anything. It was more like question and answer. You know, tell me, don't lie. Um, and they took me into a room and they started questioning me about my friends in school, uh, asking me who was like anti-revolutionary. And, you know, I thought this was really silly because they hardly had the list. So why they were asking me who was anti-revolutionary just didn't, didn't make any sense. And then they wanted to know the whereabouts of a friend of a friend of mine whom I had met only once. She belonged to a leftist group. Apparently, she was very important to the regime. They really wanted to find her. And they knew that I knew her. I had met her once. Apparently, they had been watching her. So they wanted to know her whereabouts. And when I told them, I don't know, I really met this girl only once, they thought I was lying, that I was hiding something. So they didn't believe me. And that was when um, they took me to a hallway, to another hallway, like, you know, a few hallways down. And that was where they made me sit. And this was where people were being tortured. And a man was screaming. As I listened to those screams, I couldn't think. Nothing existed. There were just those screams. And I was sitting there unable to connect the dots or understand anything or to realize exactly what was going on. It was just beyond my understanding. And then you went into a room 
to be tortured. That's right. They they tied me to a bed. That's what they did. They tied me to a bed just like everybody else, you know. And um, it was a bare wooden bed. They would make you lie on your stomach. And then they would uh, tie um, your ankles and your wrists and tie it to the bed. And then they would lash the soles of your feet with this length of cable. Really, really hard. And it's amazing how much that hurts. Like I had broken my arm before that. And I knew what pain was. But one of those strikes and your whole body just feels like it's being ripped apart. It's, it's beyond belief, that pain. Marina, you were only 16 years old at the time. You were a kid. Absolutely. Please tell me that this was an exception to the rule, that, that they didn't make a habit of rounding oh. up children and putting them in political oh prisons. Oh, my gosh, no. During 81 and 91, at any given time, there were about 35,000 political prisoners in Iran's prisons, and about 90% of them were between the ages of 15 and 20. That friend of mine I told you was arrested and executed before me. She was 15 years old. You know, when, when they sent me to this dorm area, this, this building um, in, in the prison, uh, that was a girl's dorm. Um, there were rooms that used to, well, they were cells that during the time of the Shah, they used to ha- hold about five to six people. At this time, there were 50, 60 girls in each one of these rooms. You can imagine the population explosion and that we didn't have room to do anything. Sleeping at night was a big challenge because we were like sardines, you know. Even the hallway was used for sleeping. Going to the bathroom, you got in the lineup to go to the bathroom in the morning. At noon, your turn came. And then by the time you went to the bathroom, you had to go back in line so that to be able to go to the bathroom again in the evening. And everybody was 15, 16, 17. If you were 20, you would be considered really old. Marina, would you read to us from your book about what happens next? Sure. Where are they taking me? Walk properly or I'll shoot you right here, Hamid barked. I struggled on. We were finally told to stop and someone removed my blindfold. An intense light shone into my face, blinded me, and created a sharp bolt of pain that exploded in my head. After a few seconds, I looked around. A spotlight cut the night like a white sparkling river. Blending into ghostly shadows, black hills surrounded us. We seemed to be in the middle of nowhere. There were no buildings close by. The night sky was patched with clouds gliding against a lace of sparkling stars. A few snowflakes floated lightly in the air, trying to prolong their crystalline flight before facing an earthly death. There were four other prisoners with me, two girls and two young men. Four revolutionary guards were pointing their guns at us, their faces expressionless as if carved out of the darkness. Move next to the poles! Hamid yelled out, his voice echoing against the hills. Twenty feet away, a few wooden poles, which were about my height, reached out of the ground. We were about to be executed. Marina, did you know at that point that you were going to your death? I had no idea. They did just, you even know you were sentenced to death? No, I had no idea. You know, I was a girl that had grown up reading Jane Austen and watching Little House on the Prairie. This is, this is what we are talking about. They told us, to, okay, they put the, blind, the fl- blindfolds were on and they just took us away. I thought, okay, we are going to another building. And frankly, I wasn't thinking anything at the moment because I was in pain. My feet, I had been lashed and my feet were each, you know, tw- well, three times probably as big as they were supposed to be. So I was just struggling to walk. So every step was painful. Then, you know, it it was cold. I was freezing. My teeth were chattering. I wasn't even concerned that much about where we were going. I just wanted to get there because it was just so painful to walk. And then they told us to remove the blindfolds. And I looked around and it really took a while to register because I had no idea where this place was or what was happening. And then the poles were there. I had seen this in movies. You know, that was the only reference I had in my head. And I thought, oh... They are actually going to kill us, I think. And they came and they tied us to the poles. And this is when it clicked. But still, you know, 
I still couldn't comprehend why are they doing this? To, like it didn't make any sense whatsoever. How do you make sense of something that has no logic to it at all? That's Marina Naamet. She's in the studio with me discussing her memoir. It's called Prisoner of Tehran. You're listening to The Mimi Gerges Show. We're on the web at mgshow.org. Just moments before you were to be executed, Ali, who was one of your interrogators, comes and takes you away. That's right, he did. He just showed up in his car, just stopped right there, got out of the car, gave a, gave a sheet of paper to the other guard, the, the head of the guards who was there, Hamid. And he read it and he nodded and Ali came to me, untied me from the pole and just threw me in his car and he drove away. And as he drove away, I heard guns fire. So I, I didn't see it. But as far as I know, all the people who were with me, they were killed that night. And this was a nightly event in Evin when I was later taken to the dorm. Every night we heard gunshots right behind our walls. And we knew that people are getting executed right behind the wall where we are. There were girls who were worried about their husbands, their brothers, their uh, sisters, their mothers. Their f- and they knew that they could be right there being killed as we were. But we just sat there and we just listened quietly and we counted the shots. Just this figure out like how many because, you know, they, they, uh, I think they, they shot people in the head at the end. So that those, those um, you know, single shots at the end, we counted those. And we could tell how many people were killed that night. What did Ali say to you when he took you away? He didn't say anything. He took me to, to a solitary cell. It was this tiny room, toilet and a sink in a corner. And I collapsed when we got there. And um, then he just stayed there. He just sat there. And um, then he said that I was stupid, that I should have cooperated, that it was my own fault. It was absolutely my own fault what had happened. And he said that he had to use his family connections to Ayatollah Khomeini to have my sentence reduced from execution to life in prison. And I was thinking, wait a second, I didn't have a trial. Now, this was going through my head. I didn't say anything because to me, a trial, you know, you have one of those big rooms, you have the judge, the, you know, all those people who are usually involved in a trial. And I thought, I never saw that come. Like, it, it never happened to me. But then yet again, I was so exhausted. And I was still in shock that I didn't really say anything. He said, I'm sending you to a dorm. You're going to go there. Things are going to get better. I'm going away. So that's it. And you had no idea why? I mean, did you know that he was in love with you? I had no idea. I was absolutely oblivious, entirely. I was just tired. I just wanted them to let me sleep. But when it dawned on you that now you had been saved from execution by this guy, but now you have a life sentence, did you start to think, wait a minute, why didn't you just let me die? I don't want to stay here my whole life. The thought did cross my mind. It did. I felt guilty because I knew that all the ones who were with me had been killed. But again, you know, at the age of 16, you are full of life. And I had this hope in me, this naive kind of hope, I guess. At the time, it didn't seem naive at all. It it seemed like reality that this is going to be over. This is a nightmare. It's going to be over and I'm going to go home. And everything is going to be absolutely the same. And I believe that. Now, you had mentioned that you were a a devout Christian. Are there a lot of Christians in Iran? My gosh, no. At the time, I think the population was of of altogether minorities, you know, Jewish, Christian, Zoroastrians, was about 1% of the population. Now it's less because many left after the revolution. How did you come to be Christian? Well, my grandmothers were a Russian. They married Iranian men who were working in Russia before the 1917 communist revolution. And when the revolution happened, foreigners, the husbands, were not allowed to stay there any longer. So the wives who were Russian, Russian Orthodox Christians, they came to Iran with their husbands. Now my uh, dad's father, died immediately after they came back to Iran. He was killed. And my grandmother raised my father, and she was a devout Christian. So my father was baptized, and he went, you know, my grandmother took him to church. So, and my grandmother was the one who actually raised me for the first seven years of my life. So I went to church every Sunday, 
and I prayed, you know, and all of that. So I, I was a Christian, you know, that, that was the faith I had known when, when I was born. My guest is Marina Naumet. She spent over two years in a political prison in Iran. Her book is called Prisoner of Tehran. Marina, Ali comes back with an offer. What was it? Well, he came back about four months after he had left me in the, in the, in the dorm with the girls. And I was called to the interrogation building. And I was really, you know, it was really intimidating because anybody who went to the interrogation building, you know, you could, you could get tortured again. So I was scared. And then when I saw Ali, you know, I thought, and I looked around the room, there were no torture beds. So that was a little bit, you know, relieving. And then he made me sit down and he said that he had been at the war front because Iran was in war with Iraq at the time. And um, he had come, he had been shot in the leg and that was why he was back. And he said that he had been thinking of me all this time. He, he, was, he was away and that he wanted, because, because I was a prisoner and because he had saved my life and I, I, as a prisoner, I had no rights whatsoever, he wanted me to marry him. And he said, if I didn't, he would arrest my parents. So I just looked at him. You know, my idea was that you usually fall in love with somebody, then you get married. You know, I had that Jane Austen picture in my head, you know, kind of the, the man I was going to marry kind of looked like Mr. Darcy, you know, really handsome, you know, kind of gentleman coming along on a white horse or something. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, you don't. Like, I said to him, I said, but I don't love you. Why would I marry you? And he said, well, this has nothing to do with love. And, you know, you have to marry me. You're a prisoner. I saved your life. You have no rights. When you're in a place like Evin, there is no future in a way. There's only the present and then you only have the past. So you really rely on your good memories from your home and the way your life used to be before here. And I would have done anything to protect that idea of home. If he arrested my parents, there would be no home to go back to. So it wasn't a noble thing that I decided, oh, to sacrifice myself, you know, and to marry this man I hated because I wanted to save my parents. It wasn't that way at all. I was really saving myself. I thought, if my parents get here, I'm not going to be able to go back home. There will be no home. So, okay, I guess I have to do this. Part of the deal was that you would have to convert to Islam. That's right. How did you feel about that? Oh, I felt horrible. When they made me convert, it was a ceremony during the Friday prayer, which is uh, a social deal. You know, everybody gets together for the Friday, Friday prayer, and there's this imam in the head. And this, this happened in Evin, in the open space. All the employees were present. And I went up, and um, they did the ceremony. And I remember it was a beautiful, sunny day, and I was so scared. I felt like Judas. And I thought any moment... A bolt of lightning or something from heaven, like this big piece of rock or something, is going to fall on my head because I really, really felt like a traitor. I was betraying myself. I was betraying God. I was betraying Jesus. I was betraying anybody. But again, what was even stronger than all of that was home. So I realized that I'd rather protect my home than protect my religion. And that was a huge blow because I realized, you know what, I'm not a saint. Ali takes you to meet his parents. That's right. And here you are, a 17-year-old by now. You're a Christian. You are a political prisoner. You've got a life sentence. Not exactly somebody you take home to see your parents. I mean, how did they react? No. Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, when his mother opened the door, when, when, when we went to the house, and the look on her face, you know, when she, she's a very small woman. And when she, the way she looked at me, what I saw in her eyes was fear and pity. And I expected to see some sort of anger or hatred. But it wasn't there. I, I suddenly realized that she felt sorry for me. That was, that was my impression. And then she led us into the house and she served us tea and she served us sweets. And, you know, she was so kind and so gentle and so normal that it was just surreal. It was like I was a normal person and I had gone to my best friend's house 
for tea. And now we were just having a normal conversation. And I welcomed that because she was a mother and she was there giving me tea. And that was something that hadn't happened in ages. I hadn't had tea like that with normal people. So I just, you know, sat there and I just played along and I just smiled at everybody and we just enjoyed dinner. How did you feel about Ali? At the beginning, I absolutely hated him entirely. He wasn't even really good looking or anything. He was really big and tall and scary. At the beginning, I absolutely hated him, especially, you know, the first, I would say, week after the marriage, because, you know, I realized that what was happening was that, you know, I was being raped under the name of marriage. And that this was how my life was going to be probably forever. So I absolutely hated him at, at that stage. Then, well, it was um, when we got married the same day, his mother told me that Ali had been a political prisoner himself during the time of the Shah before the revolution. So that just gave me just a hint, you know, just a hint there that I suddenly thought, you know what? I don't know this man at all. So there was suddenly this little crack of doubt just kind of coming into me. But it took a while before I actually saw him just as a man who had both good good and evil in him at the same time. It was after I saw that the, the marks that were left on his back, lash marks on his back, that I realized he had been tortured too, just, you know, similar to the way that I had been. And this created some sort of an understanding between us. Tell us about the night that Ali died. Ali told me, he told me that he wanted to resign from his job in Evin. Um, he had been having problems in the prison with some of the authorities. And he had tried to help some of the prisoners that he thought had received really harsh sentences. And he had failed a few times. And he was really, really upset about this, the, the, the way the prison was being run. And maybe it was about two weeks before the day that was actually marked on the calendar as the last day that he would work in Evin. And then after that, he had got the permission that I would move to the house he had bought for us and I would live with him under his direct supervision. I was still a prisoner. We, we went to his parents' house for dinner. Late at night, we came out. And right at the door of, a pa- of his parents, these, in this area, there are houses with huge, huge yards. So we had to park the car on the street. There was no driveway. So we had to walk this distance, not too long, from the door of the house to the car. And this was maybe 11-ish at night. And as soon as we started walking, I heard the sound of a motorcycle. Now... The, the sound of the motorcycle at the time, at that time of the night, meant there's something bad going to happen because there had been a lot of shootings and a lot of assassinations going on all around, all over the place. So I didn't have time to react. But Ali reacted. He pushed me really, really hard, and I hit the ground uh, with my um, arms, and even my face hit the ground a little bit. And then I heard shots fired. And... Then Ali fell on me, so I couldn't move, I couldn't breathe. And for a second, I thought I had been shot too because I just felt so weird. Then his parents, they they came out and they were screaming, they were saying something. I managed to move, Ali's dad um, helped, and I realized that it was he who had been shot. And there was blood everywhere. And I remember how... I, I can't say I was scared. I wasn't scared. It, it wasn't fear. It was surprise. I was surprised that there was so much blood. And I was trying to figure out why does somebody have so much blood? Because there was blood everywhere. And Ali was having difficulty to breathe. At that moment, I realized that I didn't want him to die. Why not? I, I mean, I had really, you fallen in love with him? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think it was love in the way... We understand. I don't know what it was. I cannot say I was in love with him, but I cared about him in a very strange way. I cannot explain it at all. I still don't understand, but I didn't want him to die. 
he was the only one, I guess, who had protected me during all this time of being in prison. He was the only one who knew everything about me and I could rely on. That was always there. If I got in trouble, if there was something going on, you know, in the prison or anything, I could always ask him for help. And then he was dying. I didn't want that to happen. But he asked his father to, to, to take me home. That those were, were his last words. He said, Dad, take her home. Take her, her family, home to your to family. Her family. That's what he said. And I passed out. I passed out. Ali died that night, and I woke up in hospital. And I was there for a few days. I was really, really in shock. I was in and out of consciousness. I don't have a clear memory of those days. Everything is just in a fog, in a really thick fog. And then I was returned to the prison once I was better. And Ali's father, he came to see me after a few days. And he said, we have been trying to release you, but we have not been able to because, you know, some of the authorities in, in Evin, you know, another faction of the government, they are against it. And he told me that um, he had information that suggested that Ali had been uh, assassinated by another faction in the government in the prison, actually, and that the prosecutor of Tehran, Asadullah Lajavardi, was actually behind it. You were released out of prison. You reconnected with Andre, who was your, your love, and you two decided to get married. But then again, you had problems. Yes, I did, because I had converted to Islam. And I was considered a Muslim woman now. It didn't matter if it was forced or anything. The government didn't care. I was a Muslim woman. And according to Islamic rules, a Muslim woman is not allowed to marry a Christian man. The other way is allowed. That means that a um, Christian woman is allowed to marry a Muslim man. So if I married a Christian man, I would be breaking the law. And again, by the rules of Islam that governed the country at the time, if I did this, I would be condemned to death. Again. Again. So, you know, it was just, I went home and, you know, with Andre and everything, he never really asked me to marry him. We just kind of knew we were going to do it. And then he said, oh, where, when are we, one day, he just out of the blue, he said, when are we getting married? And I said, hmm, you know, summer kind of sounds good. So we set it for July 18th, 15 months after I had been released. And my family was just fuming over it. They said, you're stupid. You're an idiot. You haven't learned anything. You know, they're going to come and get you again. This time they, they're, def they're definitely going to kill you. But you know what? It didn't matter because I realized, you know, when I went home, I realized that my home wasn't the same. I wasn't the same. Nothing was the same. So I learned, I guess what I had learned from this whole crazy experience was that you cannot protect your home, really. You cannot really protect yourself. You cannot protect anything. All you can do, the only thing you have authority to do is to be who you are. That's it. In that single second that you're alive, you are able to be yourself. That is a choice you make. So I made that choice. I thought, you know what? I'm going to marry Andre because that's what I want to do. So we got married. Do you have any regrets, Marina? I have no regrets, nothing, zero. Because everything that happened to me made me who I am today. And why would I want to be any different? I learned so much about life. When I look at people here in North America, you know, when people live really comfortable lives, they do not accumulate the kind of experience that could guide you through difficult situations and could help you have a clear understanding of who you are and what's really important. And I wouldn't change that for the world ever. That's Marina Naamed. She spent over two years in a political prison in Iran between the ages of 16 and 18. She's currently living in Canada. Her memoir is called Prisoner of Tehran. Marina, thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you very much for having me.